Duolingo has a reputation. What started as a daily reminder to do your language lessons through push notifications quickly turned into a meme that for a while was probably the most well-known phrase about the app, Spanish or vanish. It referred to the app's somewhat pushy tendency of reminding you to keep up your daily streak because you wouldn't want to break that promise that you made to yourself about learning a language, would you? But did what started as a joke 10 years ago make us forget the question that we really should have been asking? Was there a reason beyond language learning that the owl would remind you to use it? Combined with Duo's affinity for bizarre sentences, this turned the green owl into somewhat of a mascot for everyone from middle school kids to their grandmas. In a recent speech, Duolingo's CEO proudly stated that Duo has become a zeitgeist of this time. And with the constant updates, tweaks, additions, removals, new paywalls and all the rest of it, the conversation around Duolingo was always what do you think of the latest feature? What is the new update? Do I like it? Is the tree better? Is this more fun? How many gems are my lingots worth? Is it better on iOS or on Android? And from 2019 when I stopped using it, I've only seen the conversation become more focused on these questions. Is it better on a browser? Should I use hints? Should I buy hearts? Get Super Duolingo? What can I spend gems on? On and on it continued and I can't help thinking that some of Duolingo's higher ups were welcoming these questions. Because the more people were thinking about hearts, avatars, animations, gems, paywalls, the less likely it was that they'd turn around as I did four years ago, survey the landscape and think, hang on, can you even learn a language like this? Does Duolingo even work? You can probably guess the conclusion I came to, and I'll show you why. Shana chicos. Throughout this video, I want you to have the following question in mind. If a resident of outer Sydney, such as myself, were to walk to Sydney Airport before boarding the next flight to San Francisco, then upon arrival in the USA, what significance should the original walk to the airport be given within the scale of the whole trip. For the last couple of years, I haven't paid much attention to Duolingo, but I started looking into this once more when I was made aware of a recent change that they made to it via a video from Evan Edinger, a guy I'm sure many of you know. And by the way, I don't click on videos from channels that I don't like. In fact, I don't really see that many videos from channels that I don't like because I've trained myself to just click don't recommend channel whenever I see something crop up that I know to be crap. So the fact that I was already subscribed to Evan and chose to see what he had to say on this topic shows you that I like Evan. I only click on videos that I think will be interesting, valuable or entertaining and that's what I think of Evan's videos in general. To give you the best value on hamburgers, we're going to stop selling you hamburgers. <laughs> hey! So here, as one language learner to another, I'm questioning the methods and the effectiveness of them. I'm not criticising the person. The change that Duolingo has made for the record is that they've now removed the sentence discussion forums where you were able to ask questions about a particular sentence or phrase and they had this for almost every sentence and phrase in every language. This isn't improving anyone's experience. This is straight up removing a feature that has been vital for everyone using the app's learning experience since day one. Since this change, the only record that you can see that these sentence discussions ever existed is via your old emails if you had those email notifications turned on. And to say that people are unhappy about the feature's removal would be a gross understatement, which we're going to return to later because it paints a good picture of what's going on. But back to our main question of whether Duolingo is even effective, why Evan is so important in this equation is that he is an OG when it comes to Duolingo and particularly when it comes to a documented journey of it. He has probably the most well-documented journey with languages on Duolingo of anyone. Evan has a streak that is now approaching 3,000 days and a video from almost six years ago called Fluent in German with Duolingo. He also has numerous other videos on the topic, many of which imply if not flat out stating that you can become fluent in a language by using Duolingo. Now just to be clear about what I'm saying here, I don't care what the titles are. This is not a petty complaint about what videos are called. And in fact, by ordinary YouTube standards, Evan is not a clickbaity guy. But around that time, and remember we are talking nearly six years ago now, Evan's claims of being fluent in German were not just being made in the titles, 
but in the videos themselves. I'll be teaching you all of my tips and tricks on how I became, for the most part, conversationally fluent in German using nothing but the free language learning app, Duolingo. It works. It, it really works. I can attest to that because in November, I went to a trip to Australia with two German vloggers from Stuttgart. I could literally speak a language that was not English using just a free language learning app. That's amazing. Can you become fluent using just Duolingo? I'm gonna give it a soft yes. Now, if you're thinking that I've clipped that out of context, you'd be right, sort of. So I will return to that issue later. But this live stream that you're about to see was done almost a year after that video. And it's not as if he wasn't working on his German during that time. He kept up with Duolingo and about six months later moved to Germany. So this live stream was done while he was living in Germany. Um, so, um, the stream. Um, hast du eine Frage für mich uh, über meine uh, Ausbildung in... Ausbildung? Uh, Ausbildung in uh, Deutschland, aber, I mean, oder, uh, 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 irgendwas, else? Else, uh, irgendwas, oh, ich, ich weiß, uh, ich weiß das Wort für else. Um, übrigens! Now, it's not my intention to harass Evan here. I get it. Live streaming is very difficult. There is no hard and fast definition of fluency and sometimes words just don't flow like they should in any language and I'm no stranger to this. But even the most generous assessment of Evan's German at this point would not call it fluent and it would be fair to assume that it was worse a year before when he had made this video. That is over two years of daily use. It's not it does seem that Evan has revised his assessment of his German from that time, saying that back then he couldn't really speak it, which is part of why he moved to Munich. I had been learning German for ages at that point, but I couldn't speak any of it because I really didn't have a chance to. And that's totally fair. As you get better at things, you realize how bad you used to be at them, and your assessment of your own skill level can and I would even say should step down. So my point isn't that Evan is being inconsistent, but by this point, it looks like he's been keeping on with Duolingo close to every day for three years and not in any small way either. Education. I'd spend anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour a day learning Duolingo every day, where every once in a while I'd spend more than an hour if I was just having a fun time with it or if I had a lot of extra free time. And not just the ordinary lessons, but the stories as well, which are cited by many people as its most effective feature. And I would agree with that. I do think stories are more effective, which is why I'm happy to affiliate with story learning when they've got deals going. But when I hear what Evan says in multiple videos over six years and put that against the results that he had in German and seems to be happy to have again in Spanish, I can't help but see dissonance. It's not working. The Duolingo, I mean. And if it is, it's so slow and has so much help from other resources that are more useful. At that point, is it really the Duolingo that's working? That's why I asked before about walking to Sydney airport in order to catch a flight to San Francisco. It would take me as long to walk to the airport as it would for the plane to traverse the Pacific. But would it then be fair for me to arrive in the USA and credit my journey to walking? I mean, it was after all half the journey by time, but by distance, it's less than 1%. And if you're wondering why anyone would walk such a distance to the airport anyway, I'm wondering the same thing. Why would you use such a slow vehicle being Duolingo in order to get you to the stage that you can do something more effective when there are faster options available? In language learning, there are the equivalent of bicycles and buses and taxis, and I'll tell you about some of them in a bit. Ideally, you would get on the plane from day one. You would start doing what was most effective on the first day. But I understand that not everyone can just dive headfirst into reading books and watching series without subtitles and listening to podcasts. But it helps to understand that until you do that, until you start getting comprehensible input that soaks your consciousness in the target language itself, you are just not on a plane. Whether it's on foot or on a bicycle or on a bus, you are not going to cross the ocean that way. Not just because they're too slow, but because those things don't cross oceans. 
I'm not saying that Evan doesn't speak German today. He's back living in Germany and getting ready to take a B2 exam. And all credit to him for taking what started as just mucking around with Duolingo and actually going somewhere with that. But my concern here is the lesson that he and seemingly thousands of others have taken from this that Duolingo works. Just by using this app. It was effective, I am conversationally fluent, I've made previous videos about that. This is baffling to me because when you look at the cluster of activities that Evan did in order to learn German, even if they were somewhat sporadic, because yes, I understand learning German was his hobby, not his life, but even so, taking eight years to gear up for a B2 exam in an anglo semblant language like German tells me that at least one thing he did was not effective. And I highly doubt that it was reading books in German or moving to Germany. So coming back to the context that I clipped out of Evan's video earlier, he has spoken at length in that video and others about how he learned German. So he obviously mentions other resources, but then we have to agree that phrases like just using Duolingo or using nothing but Duolingo or only using a free language learning app, they all mean the same thing. And this is not semantics. They are categorically incorrect. You can walk to the airport and you can assign more or less weight to that leg of the journey if you want to, but you can't walk across the Pacific Ocean. To be fair to Evan, he did say these things a long time ago. I also said things in my early videos that I now disagree with, but his newer videos express a pretty similar sentiment. But perhaps more tellingly, he's repeating the same actions. He's been learning Spanish for over three years now. It seems odd to me that from his experience with German, Evan doesn't seem to have learned what language learning really is, what it is you're actually trying to do that moves the needle. Because as we approach 2024, if I'm to be blunt, there is no need to use something as slow and gimmicky as Duolingo to learn Spanish. With some languages, Scots Gaelic, Hawaiian, etc., Duolingo represents an option among a pool of very few. But with Spanish, English speakers especially are spoiled for choice, and that is only considering high quality free options. To name a few quickly, Busu now has a free tier and Busu Premium is half the price of Super Duolingo. Dreaming Spanish upload two free videos a week. Story Learning have a Spanish YouTube channel on which they do the same. Most of Spanish Pod 101 stuff is available for free and this is before I've even gone looking for podcasts and YouTube channels etc that are specifically for learning Spanish. Hola a todos y todas. Bienvenido a Español Automático. It's also without considering anything that would be hard mode, that is by natives for natives. Investigan en Google o lo que sea el nombre del restaurante el hotel y digan este sí sí es que voy ahí a... <laughs> because although it definitely gets results in the end it's intolerable for most people it would be extremely painful in the sydney to san fran plane analogy some people feel that doing this is like zip lining from a c117 hercules like in the dark knight rises you're definitely moving but you're gonna flail around a lot you might die yes the fire rises a fair response to all this could be lamont Language learning is your job. You have to know the options that are out there for people to learn languages. Not everyone's gonna know those, and that's true. So if you happen to be learning Spanish, now you do know about that other stuff. But if you're learning a language that's even remotely popular, you'd be amazed how much stuff is out there that you just don't know about yet. What puzzles me about Duolingo's growing popularity and persistence within this conversation is that for the last 10 years or so, other platforms have just been getting better and better, while Duolingo, according to its most active users, is going backwards. Why are we still using it? And I think it's mainly due to the very thought that you may have had about this video here, which is something like, dude, so what? You don't like Duolingo, Evan does, it's not hurting anyone, it's helping people to get into language learning, and it's free. I once thought that too. I used it for over a thousand days, but those thousand days started seven years ago. And I don't think those arguments hold water anymore. The easiest one to deal with is that it's free. It's freemium, like a lot of things. That's not rare at all. Duolingo went from being a free language learning app that anyone could access and learn a language for free to a language learning app that was still free, but you could pay for and your experience would be a bit better 
to the point where they've removed so many features that now you have to spend 20 pounds for the privilege of learning your language effectively. And whether you pay or not, Duolingo has your data, which they recently leaked by the way. They've also recently partnered up with OpenAI, so presumably whether you like it or not, you're now providing training data for Agent Smith. And lastly, it's not even really trying to be free. The CEO himself said that the people who pay are generally covering the costs of the people in poorer countries who don't pay. And honestly, I like that. In my opinion, that's a good thing but I'm pretty sure that an ethical charity that I donate to can use that same amount of money to do more effective work in the same place than an app can. So don't mishear me, there's nothing wrong with paying for Duolingo, but personally, I'd sooner either donate the money or spend it on a better platform or both. And I'll address the other two together. It's not hurting anyone and it's helping people to learn a language. If we're talking about people in Guatemala or Ethiopia who do have access to a smartphone that works, but don't have access to anything else, and this is the best we can do, then of course, yeah, this is the best we can do. I'm not suggesting that Duolingo is a global evil that must be stopped, but for people in the rich Western world, I think Duolingo is just good at making you think that you're learning a language. You're getting things right, you're turning the units purple, you're winning the game. And Duolingo's marketing has made us think that winning that game is to learn a language, but they're very different games, and I can prove it. For my first foreign language, Swedish, I basically did Duolingo and italki, and I did a lot of both of those things. I tried to talk way too much. I was never getting the language into my brain in large enough amounts to build up a knowledge of anything new to say. So I just got better at saying whatever I'd said the last time. But I also did all the Duolingo. There wasn't a word or phrase in the Swedish Duolingo tree that I didn't know very well. I spent over an hour a day for two years. That's almost 800 hours, plus I talky lessons a few times a week. Still, after that long, and I was very embarrassed about this at the time, but if I tried to watch a Swedish series with just Swedish subtitles, I had no idea what was going on. I would go to Swedish parties and gatherings in Sydney and I could hold a conversation, but as soon as they spoke to each other rather than to me, nothing. I would try to read a novel along with the audiobook and I would be able to match what I was reading with the audio, which is one of the reasons I recommend that to people, but my comprehension was like 20%. But a few years later, I found out how language learning really works. And that is that the reading, the audiobooks, the podcasts, the series that you sort of only kind of understand, that is the work that must be done because that is where your brain molds itself to the patterns of the language. That is when you start crossing the Pacific. That is when you're on the plane, but it doesn't feel like it because you're not in first class. You're in something worse than the most budget economy. The seats don't recline because there are no seats. It's confusing, noisy, and uncomfortable. The cabin's not pressurized so you can barely breathe, but there are no windows so you can't really work out where you are or how long you've got to go. Now putting the hyperbole aside, in that scenario, are you not still in the air? You're still making the trip, right? And there are actually ways to make it more comfortable than that sounds. But the point is, the trip is being made. And isn't that what you want? So fast forward to this time last year, when I find out that I might get to go to Mexico in five months, and I skipped straight to the plane bit, obviously. I speed ran the Story Learning Spanish beginner course. I speed ran the Refold ES1K deck and made a video about it. These were like my taxis to the airport, you could say. I started watching and listening to Dreaming Spanish videos whenever I could, and then jumped straight into Harry Potter with no audio because I didn't know where to get it at the time. But I don't think you're quite ready for Harry Potter level books when you finish Duolingo. You're ready to read some things, but not necessarily at that like grade level. I started reading this in Spanish because it was the most level appropriate thing that I happened to own at the time. And the total time spent learning Spanish before then was maybe like 40 or 50 hours over four weeks. Was it difficult? Yes, would the same thing work in Chinese? No, obviously not. Would it be even harder if I hadn't have read it before in English? Yes, of course. But so what? I don't need to pretend that I didn't have that in my favor because I'm not trying to make myself out to be a genius. I had read it before and they don't speak Chinese in Mexico, so I don't care. I'm using whatever advantages I have to make sure I get on that plane as soon as possible because that is when you actually start moving. The Duolingo German tree is 
enormous. And so is the Spanish tree, by the way. So I think it would take a minimum of 160 hours to complete the whole thing, and that would be rushing it. So if it's true that the German tree, which some sources suggest might take 400 hours, would really not ready you to read Harry Potter, then I genuinely believe you're trying to walk across the ocean at that point. It's not going to take a really long time. It's not going to happen. And even if we disregard the differences between Evan's experience and my own, let's just look at my own in Swedish versus Spanish. I went to Mexico after five months of not very intensive study because as much as I wanted to do more Spanish, I didn't have time. I was part of a team trying to organize an overseas trip for 40 kids. But when I got to Mexico, I was able to buy things, discuss prices, describe what I wanted, and most importantly, understand what they were saying to me. In my first five months of Swedish, I'd have put in three or four times the amount of hours because I had nothing else on back then. I only had one kid at that time. But still, after those five months, I'd have been completely screwed in any real life situation that demanded Swedish. So no, I'm going to reject that Duolingo is helping us all to learn languages, and I'm going to reject that it can't hurt, because not only is it not very effective, but it's good at convincing people that it is effective and getting them hooked on it, like a bad diet pill. Does this mean I'm gonna stop using the app? No, like I said, it's really frustrating. They, you know, they hijack you with the streak freezes and whatnot. This video started out as a very different video. It was much more lighthearted, and it was just discussing the removal of the sentence discussion tabs. But as I looked through more of the comments on Evan's video about it, I realized that lots of people were exhibiting behavior that suggested almost like an addiction or at least an unhealthy relationship with this app that they don't even like. The video has over 2,600 comments and I didn't find a single one that was in support of the change. But I also only found one, one comment that suggested that the person was actually done with Duolingo. I found a lot of people suggesting that this change or some other one or a combination of changes were horrible things that they shouldn't have done. I found a lot of people obviously angry, sad, some people even suggesting that they were depressed. But in all that anger and sadness over this change, I could still only find one person with the resolve to just turn around and walk away. And I think it's because honestly, these people don't know where else they can go. It makes me extremely grateful that I turned away from my 1000 day streak back when it was only 1000 days. Had it have been over 2500 days as it would be by now, I'm not sure I'd be able to do it and I've heard others express the same thing. I understand that this may seem very quaint to you as it initially did to me, but think about it from a business perspective. Imagine that you owned a product that you'd successfully convinced the users of they must keep using daily, no matter how much they dislike the changes made to it. Because if they don't, they might lose potential years of work. That is a market position that very few brands enjoy. Nike, Amazon, Sony, they're all commercial giants. But with all of those, customers feel like they have a different option if those brands just get it totally wrong. What's really sad is that the comments that are amongst some of the most desperate about how this is really going to negatively impact their learning and they don't know what else they're going to do, they are coming from people learning French, Spanish, Japanese, some of the most resource-rich languages in the world. So not only are there numerous other options, but a lot of the time, those options were already superior to Duolingo before they made this change. So if you take one thing from this video, it should be that even if you're learning a language that is a little bit more niche, you do have other options. When you step away from the puddle that is Duolingo and into the stream or the river or hopefully even the lake that is everything else that is out there for that language, it'll be so much better than you're thinking. And yeah, it may be a little bit hard to understand at first. You may not be able to get it conveniently on your phone, but there are other options out there and there are plenty of people who want to see you succeed in your language learning. You're not on your own. You don't need to give up. I don't think that everyone needs to immediately quit Duolingo as if it's a smoking addiction. But I've also seen enough in my own research on language learning to suggest that 95% of people who can watch this video could learn a language much better than they can with Duolingo, still just using their phone, if they could just accept that it might not always be a cutesy little game. 
my own journey with languages has been not at all straightforward. My journey with writing this video, even less so. So if it seems garbled, I've done my best. I hope you were able to make sense of it. I hope you got something out of it. Please feel free to ask any questions you may have. And until then, lo quiero. <laughs>